Hi, this is Miss Slitton, and this is my wonderful period two honors biology class. Say hi. 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 Okay. We are greeting. Okay. So we're going to continue on in chapter 24, control of gene expression. And so our first part, we talked about all the ways that you could control um, your DNA and the way your DNA is expressed in proteins, and we compared prokaryotic control to eukaryotic control. And now we're going to talk about if it's out of control. Okay, and um, that would be cancer. And before we start in on this conversation, and it's 911 because we're being superheroes today, 911 number one, number number. This is the first question I want to ask you, and this applies to you personally. Um, as we start to have this discussion about um, cancer. <laughs> I really should have one in there that you know no one that has had it, but even the most people have somebody that they have heard of that has had it or dealt with it. Okay, just a few more of you. Wonder Woman, Wolverine. You're slow today. All right. Okay, so if you look, if we look at some of the responses that we've had right here, I'm glad nobody here has dealt with cancer. I, I've had classes where I've had two people who have had cancer just right within that class. And, um, but if you look here, we have some people who have someone in their immediately family, in their immediate family, parents or siblings. We have some people that are experiencing that. And then we have some extended family that have had issues. So I tell you this as a point of sensitivity, um, just to be aware that for some people when we talk about this, it's very, very difficult for them to talk about it. Um, if you don't know already, my mom, who was one of my very bestest friends of all the entire world, um, passed away from cancer. And so when I talk about cancer, like when I, I'm better now because this is the second time I've taught this today, but zero period I all started crying. And it, it hits you in strange ways. Like somebody asked me, how was Thanksgiving? And then I'm like, you know, and all of a sudden I'm starting to, because that was an important holiday. So you just, you don't always know how it might hit you when you're talking about it. So I just want to encourage you to be sensitive in the room. It doesn't mean that we'll be like Debbie Downer the whole time. We might laugh. I mean, I, you do. I'll tell you a story. It's funny. It made my sister cry, but my mom had lost all of her hair and just a little bit, you know, multiple times, but it was starting to grow back. And so we took an eyebrow pencil and I outlined like where her hair should be. And for some reason, this was hilarious to my mom and I. We were just like, oh, let's draw a new hairline, you know? And we were drawing it and we were laughing because what else are you gonna sit there? Well, my sister came up the stairs to her room and saw this happening and it was just too much for her. And she just started, she just left, she started crying. But it doesn't, and those of you who have had somebody in your family, you know, it's not like all, you know, terrible, but we just need to be sensitive because people all are gonna come into this discussion. Something might remind them about it and it's gonna break their little heart. So, just be like, bio buddy, are you gonna be okay with this? Just ask your bio buddy, how is this topic with you? Do you know somebody close to you that has it? Or is it a hard topic for you? Okay, so now, so now we know where we're coming from. And you know what, if you don't have anybody close, then yay for you, I celebrate. That is awesome if you don't know somebody close. So let's talk about normal cells. Um, so normal cells have certain properties. One of those properties is called Anchorage dependence, and that is exactly how it sounds. They, they want, in order for them to function, they have to be adhered to some sort of surface. There are exceptions, obviously, to this rule. Can you think of some cells that don't exhibit any Anchorage dependence? Are there some cells that move around in your body? Yes? Blood cells. Blood cells, yeah. Red blood cells, white blood cells, these are constantly on the move. So that's not a normal for them. But most of your cells, they have to be anchored down in order to function. A second one is density-dependent inhibition. Um, or another name for this is contact inhibition. 
And this is when it starts to get crowded, they stop dividing. That is a normal function of cells. There is no, you know, there is no point to waste resources making more cells if you don't have space for those cells or nutrients for those cells. Now, if you, you can see here, when they remove a little patch of cells, then they'll fill in that gap, okay? But normally they would not do that. But cancer cells, they are not. They are abnormal, okay? They don't exhibit contact inhibition and they don't care about crowding. They'll just keep dividing and dividing and dividing. So on your notes where it says normal cell division, density dependent inhibition, crowded cells stop dividing. Crowded cells stop dividing. And then blue, you give them the um, definition of anchorage dependency. Go ahead. All right. Now, if we look at cancer cells, okay, this is a neoplasm, an abnormal growth of cells. And I'm going to tell you when I was updating this presentation, I, this was before dinner, my family was all over, so I wanted to still be a part of it, though I was working, so I was working at my dining room table before dinner. There are hideous pictures out there, and be careful what you Google. Um, I'm gonna tell you that all the pictures I'm giving you in this presentation, I am being kind. And some of you are like, well, I wanna Google it. Be my guest, it's hideous, okay? Um, this is a very kind picture of a neoplasm right here. and. This is an abnormal growth of cells. Now, if you have an abnormal growth of cells and it is still contained, it's referred to as being benign. It's encapsulated, it's in that one location, and the benefit of that is you could go in and what it? Take it out. Take it out. That's why they always tell you to check early, okay? You want to check. Ladies, they talk about checking breast tissue, right? Guys, you should be checking your? Yeah, your huevos rancheros, <laughs> your testes, okay? You should be checking those. You need to know what normal is so you can tell what abnormal is, right? Um, and so you wanna know the normal, the way, and guys, you don't need to volunteer to check anybody, okay? Just check yourself. And um, there are places where if you have a bump, and the problem is some sort of lump that's there, sometimes people like, Oh my gosh, and so they're, they don't want to admit that there could be something wrong, they're in denial, right? So what do they try to do? They just try to what it? Hide it or ignore it and just pretend it's not there. But when you pretend a lump or a problem um, isn't there, if you, try to, if you try to ignore it, then what can happen is it can become from being benign to malignant. And what it does is it can break out of its encapsulated area and basically, if cancer cells can get into your lymphatic system or they can get into your circulatory system, it's like getting on a train and they can go anywhere in the city, you know, like your body, jump off at another station and start growing there. And so you wanna catch it before it's starting to do all of that. So when you hear about stages in cancer, like for testicular cancer, stage one is in your testes. Stage two is your lymph nodes, like here in your groin area. Stage three is in your lungs. And stage four is when it moves to your brain. Much harder to fight in stage four than in stage what? One, okay? So the earlier you catch it, that's why you wanna do things like, A, not put yourself in any kind of environmental situation where you could get cancer. B, do your normal screenings, your normal checkups where you would evaluate that and, and then do your self checks, you know, as well to make sure everything is okay. And we'll talk about that as well. So on your notes, go to um, a tumor is a mass of abnormal cells within otherwise normal tissue. A benign tumor is not cancerous, it's encapsulated. It has not invaded adjacent tissue whereas a malignant tumor has or it has the ability to spread. Has the ability to spread. And when it's spreading, okay, it's metastasizing. And so, for instance, skin cancer. If you have, you, people like, like if you're fair-skinned of Germanic descent, like Germany, okay, um, if you're fair-skinned like that, 
you and you like have a lot of those freckles on your body, you want to get those checked as you age especially, okay? Because you want to look for growths that have, if you have a mole that has irregular borders, if it's really dark, if it's tender, um, if you have patches of skin that are white and dry, not like because you need to wear a moisturizer, but like in just one area repetitively, you want to get rid of those things as soon as possible. Because at this point, you have what's called a basal lamina that separates your skin from the rest of your body. And as long as it's sitting on top of that basal lamina, you go in and you'll see some of your parents or grandparents are going and getting some of those growth. They're like, oh, I had to go and get that removed, you know, and they'll just have a little scar tissue or a band-aid. Because what you don't want it to do is once it can digest down through the basal lamina, if it get, gains that mutation and has the ability to do that, then it can get in your lymphatic system, it can get in your blood supply, and then it goes from its original part to other parts of your body. And that's when they have gone in to check people and like kind of open them up and they'll say it's like sand throughout their abdominal cavities. There's so many particles, cancer particles, there's nothing they could do to actually gather all of those up and get rid of them. It would be too hard to treat, <coughs> okay? So um, if it metastasizes, cells separate from a malignant tumor and enter blood or lymph vessels and travel to other parts of the body, and travel to other parts of the body. Okay, so we haven't talked about mitosis and meiosis yet, but we will. Um, mitosis is cellular division. And normally for a cell to divide, it needs to receive the green light, a signal that says go. There are things called cyclins that have to build up at a certain level and then that will trigger the cell to divide. When you have cancerous cells, they are not undergoing their normal cell cycle. They are, they are dividing even when they're not supposed to divide. So they defy the normal regulation of that cell cycle and they have the ability to invade and colonize other areas. So if they have the wrong signals, it's because what is messed up? They're what? DNA. Because DNA, you know this, DNA codes for all of your what? Okay, what, what? Your, it starts with a P. Proteins, right? So here's the deal. If you have the wrong signal, a signal is a protein. So if you have the wrong protein, it's because you have something wrong with your DNA. Because we know how DNA tra is transcribed into what? MRNA. mRNA, and then the mRNA goes out and gets on the uh, ribosome, and that's where you do translation and build your protein. Well, if your DNA is wrong, then your mRNA is wrong. If your mRNA is wrong, then your proteins that you build off of that is wrong. So mutated genes cause wrong pro proteins and your cell cycle is out of control. And cancerous cells look totally different than normal cells. Um, they have these irregular kind of growths out the bottom like this. They have things called bleeds that will look like little blisters all over the cell. There's some other things that you can look for, hallmarks of a cancerous cell. So, um, Cancer, um, we have cellular growth disorder that results from the mutations of, did we do this one already? No. Mutations of what? What's getting mutated? Your genes, yeah. Mutations of genes that regulate the um, cell cycle. It's loss of control. Loss of control. And then carcinogenesis, what does genesis mean? Making birth. The beginning or birth, right? So this is the beginning of cancer. Most cancers take decades, right, for you to actually get cancer. If we said, let's do a little experiment today. Um, I'm all gonna give each of you a pack of cigarettes and today, all day, smoke through this pack of cigarettes. You would probably get sick, okay? But you'd be like, you know, after, you know, second period today at nutrition, lined up and like somebody walks by with you and let me on and okay. <laughs> So you go through all day long smoking your cigarette. If next week all of us got cancer, lung cancer, okay? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? If you got cancer right after you exposed yourself to that carcinogen, probably people wouldn't smoke if they got cancer right away. But when did they get cancer? 20 yeah, 20, 30 years. So right now they're like, I wanna fire it up. 
okay? And that's what they're thinking about right now. They're not thinking about 30 or 40 years down the road when they actually get lung cancer. Same thing goes for your skin cancer. People who have skin cancer as adults, older adults who have skin cancer, the incidence of skin cancer is most closely correlated with the amount of times you were sunburned as a child. So think back on your childhood, okay? Did you, you know what I mean, where you really get sunburned, okay? Now, you guys have grown up in the age of sunscreen. Some of your parents were psychotic sunscreeners, right? You couldn't leave the house unless they sprayed you down and they rubbed it in. If you went to the beach, you had a sun shirt, long sleeve, right? Um, so you grew up on that. I grew up with baby oil, okay? That's what we did. You know, we were like, oh, we're going out in the sun, let's put baby oil. It's like putting cooking oil on your body and going out in the sun, okay? But we didn't know. We didn't have that correlation of that that could cause skin cancer. Most of you have grown up with that. You put moisturizers on that have sunscreen on them. You live with that. Um, but again, that wasn't always the case. So hopefully you don't have a lot of those sunburning events um, under your uh, belt, hopefully very few of them. Um, so carcinogenesis is the development of cancer, which usually is gradual and can take decades. There's one kind of cancer, um, retinoblastoma, cancer of the eye, that can come on like this. Now I'm not talking about the speed at which it kills you. I'm talking development of cells that are out of control. Usually this has to go wrong, 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 and then you get the cancer. Now how long you last after you get that cancer, that's something different. Like for instance, one of the worst cancers to get is pancreatic cancer. Oftentimes, people who get pancreatic cancer, they will die within four to five months after they get the diagnosis. You could get another type, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, you could have that for 10 or 20 years, and you just keep managing that cancer. So different cancers have different shelf lives, so to speak. But carcinogenesis is talking about how fast do you get that cancer? What's the speed at which you have out of control cells? Okay, so that's our first box, our little introduction. And I would like the youngest bio buddy, without looking at your notes, ready for this, Russell? I yow. Um, tell them, here's three things I know about cancer so far. I yow it. Three things you know about cancer so far. Go. Uh, it's going to take a while for me to let that one go. It's going to be around for a little bit. <laughs> Characteristics of cancer cells and um, you can see these um, when my mom was at Stanford because I would go up there all the time she she would she was there I'd go up on the weekends to be with her and um, they were trying some different chemotherapies on her and they wanted to see if they had taken care of it and her cancer was in her bone marrow so they would take and remove cells out of her bone marrow that was super painful for her and because she's awake when they're removing the cells and they like literally drill into your hip they give you drugs of which she was super embarrassing when she got the drug she was saying she and I used to talk in, 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 in um, accents all the time like hideously you know we would play pretend like we'd go shopping and we pretend like we we're from Ireland like that's the accent we would use <laughs> And I, I'm embarrassed to say, and I, I'm honest, I, we were not trying to ever be racist, but we would probably hit every accent you possibly could. And I don't know why we did it. We annoyed everybody we were around in my family, but that was just something my mom and I did. My mom, bless her little heart, wonderful Asian doctor. My mom, <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you, my mom doesn't have a racist bone in her body. She'd probably slug you if you said anything racist. I mean, my mom was like, and I, we, I know this because we had a grandfather who was, and my mom was like, would go off on him. I, I, anyway, so my mom takes glasses, like she has glasses, she's got drugs, she's like, oh, doctor, you know, <laughs> you're so smart, you know, and I'm just like, 
I am like turning. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know whether to smack my mom. And I'm like, mom, stop it. And she's like, oh. You know, and I'm like, mom, stop. And she's just like, but I know she's like going to be under pain. And then the next minute she's crying. So what can you do? You know? And I don't know. And then you try to explain away your mother's bad behavior only makes it sound worse. Because you want to go, my mom is not racist. She just means it's like, this is something we play around. You know, if you were an Irish doctor, she would try to pretend like she was from Ireland. It's just something we do, you know? And oh my gosh, it was mortifying. Um, I tell her about it afterwards and like she was just like sick to her stomach, you know, she's like, oh, she was sick to her stomach because she was taking that medicine. But anyway, so they go into her hip and I'm watching it and it is flipping painful. But right there in the room, because they would let me participate in these things to watch because I was interested, they would remove these cells out of her bone marrow and it looks kind of like blood but clearish too. And look at it underneath the microscope, those cells look totally different than all your regular cells. It's not like you go, I wonder if there's still cancer in there. You're like, mm, damn. Because <laughs> you could just you could just see it right away. They do have you know quite a bit of differences. So we're gonna go through what are some of those differences that you would see. So one thing is they're very undifferentiated. Now this is a cancer cell. What do you think these white cells are? White blood cells, white blood cells. good call. So the first one, characteristics of cancer cells, lack differentiation, they are not specialized. Not specialized. They seem immortal. What does it mean to be immortal? They don't ever die. Okay. Then the second one, um, they have abnormal nuclei. And I'm going to have you role play, ping pong back and forth. Um, slate, you're going to be normal. Blue, you're going to be cancer. Okay, and so you would say, I have a large cytoplasm. I have this. So just ping pong back and forth, role playing the cancer play. Go ahead. Okay, so on your notes there, you're writing down abnormal nuclei, abnormal nuclei. Okay, and number three, these cells that go back, okay, that because they have bad proteins in them, they do not undergo apoptosis. Do you remember what apoptosis was? What? Yes, yeah. cellular suicide. Right? Cellular suicide. Cells that have gone rogue, that are bad, they should die. They should kill themselves. Okay, and there are genes. It's called a p53 gene. It codes for proteins that you will commit suicide as a cell. You've gone rogue. They don't undergo ap apoptosis. Now we've talked about apoptosis and development. That's why you have digits and not paddles for hands. We've talked about in your immune system when you develop your um, your um, clone armies of cells that can fight that infection that's in your body. When they're done, they should all commit cellular suicide except for your memory cells because you can't you don't have enough resources to keep the clone army of every single disease you've ever had in your body. So just a few cells remain. So it's a normal thing to commit apoptosis, but these cancer cells refuse to do that. They do not commit apoptosis. Um, and then, um, 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 where am I? Oh, okay. So even though a, a normal cell is um, age, uh, normal cells enter the cell cycle, I wanted you to see that about 50 times, and then they would stop. Okay. Another thing um, they fail to do, again, I'm showing you n not hideous pictures. They, they don't have that density um, dependent inhibition. They don't have contact inhibition. They will continue to grow even though they are crowded, okay? And um, so for number, um, I don't know why I keep losing my, oh, number four, they form tumors. They do not display density dependent inhibition. Okay, 
Okay, and another thing they can do is they can metastasize. They can move from one part of your body to another part of your body. Um, has anybody ever known somebody who had breast cancer? Okay, so I have had a couple girlfriends that have, one that I'm super close with had breast cancer. I've been with her through all of her surgeries. She had complete mastectomy and radiation and all that went along with that. One thing that they are constantly looking for is when you have breast cancer, it tends to show up in your bones next. And so they always worry, like, it's not if it'll come back, it's when it comes back. Maybe many years down the road, you know, you're always kind of worried about that. And so that's where it will metastasize next. Just like I told you about testicular cancer, it moves your lymph nodes and then your lungs and your brain. Um, they're looking for it in the bones, in either the feet or the hands um, as a result of that. So on your notes, um, metastasize new tumors form, which are at a distance from the primary tumor. Metastasis, new tumors form, which are at a distance from the primary tumor. Okay, and then this is super hideous that cancer does. Sometimes you'll start to have a tumor that develops and it'll be benign and you'll be able to detect it and you'll just remove it. And the reason why it becomes benign is it doesn't have enough resources to keep it alive. Because you know cells have to do what? They have to acquire and energy. So if they don't have a source of that, because there's too many of them for that area, then they will just be this benign tumor, remove it, yay. But these tumors have the ability to secrete chemicals to draw blood vessels towards it, like a pedophile with candy, okay? And they'll just sit there and they'll be like, Come here, little blood vessels. I'm so glad we're recording this. Come here. <laughs> Great. Come here, little blood vessels. And so the blood vessels are like, what? What? You want me? And so they're like, me, me. Okay, and then those blood vessels grow towards it. They dock into the tumor cell, and the tumor cell's like, ah. And then they have all the nutrients they need, and they can spread to these other places. That's called angiogenesis, the beginning of new blood vessels. So on angiogenesis, when tumor cells acquire additional mutations that um, allow them to direct the growth of new blood vessels into the tumor. New blood vessels into the tumor. All right, oldest bio buddy, two things, two characteristics about cancer that you learn, I yow, and bonus point, if you can come up with a third without even looking at your notes. in here so we we have already established okay if you have mutated genes you'll have bad mRNA and if you have bad mRNA you'll have bad what protein okay and you'll be sending the wrong signals to your cells there are two genes two groups of genes two groups or categories of genes that um, you would be concerned about with cancer okay the first one is called proto-oncogenes Proto-oncogenes are normally just fine. They are in a position of power. If, if you know me at all, if you followed me around at all in my daily life, you would see that I compulsively think military. It's like if I see somebody in, you know, I'm at Starbucks and they're in their um, uniform, I'll go and I'll say, may I please shake their hand and I have to tell them thank you. It's like if my girlfriends, when they're with me, they're like, She's going, you know, because it could be across the room. I will go and I will thank them. And I have tremendous respect for the military. But if you have a general who goes rogue and they're controlling groups of people, they're in a very powerful position to do a lot of damage. So that's why I used an army general here, okay? So if you have in a position of power, um, now the ironic part about this is this is General Petraeus. And I made this slide four years ago. It's just ironic that he happens to be in the news again right now. But um, anyway, if you have a position of power, okay, 
And and you if you do make a mistake along those lines, then you're controlling a lot of other things that will happen. And there are genes that are called proto-oncogenes. If they go bad, they're called oncogenes. What kind of doctor do you go to if you, have, you go to an oncologist? And this is how they are powerful. This is where the power lies. Their power lies in that they promote the cell cycle. Remember I said cancer cells are like immortal cells because they keep doing what? Mitosis. Yeah, they keep doing mitosis. They divide, 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 divide. The reason why they're dividing is because a proto-oncogene has now become an oncogene. It's mutated and it keeps sending the signal divide, 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 divide. Now, that would not be the end of the world. Chances are you have a cancer cell like this every single day of your life. Did you hear me? Every single day of your life. You can have a cell that goes rogue. But normally what you do is you take care of it. You have tumor suppressor gene. And this is why I picked assassins. Do you know who that is? Yes. So you have assassins who say, oh, you've gone, I know you belong to us, but I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to kill you, okay? Because you've gone rogue. You are growing out of control. So normally we kill off those bad cells. So cancer is a combination of one gene saying go, 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 and your tumor suppressor genes who are normally supposed to take care of those types of cells, they, they're an assassin, but they're shooting blanks, okay? They're not wiping them out, and as a result, now they have, you have cancer, you have uncontrollable growth. So we're, we're gonna break down both of those. On your notes, you see origin of cancer. So there's two that we've listed, proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor. So we're gonna start with the proto-oncogenes. If it mutates into an oncogene, it will cause cancer by coding for proteins that facilitate the cell cycle. They tell the cell cycle to go. An example I would use is this. Some of you have your driver's license right now or you're in the beginning stages of getting your driver's license. You know, now it's totally different rules than when I was a kid, when you get your driver's license, are you allowed to transport another student mm -hmm. or friend? No, not for how long? Mm -hmm. A year. So let's say you decide, nah, I'm gonna transport a friend, okay? And you're in the car, you're approaching a busy intersection. And so you know, because you've gone through your driver's training, that you should take your foot off of the what? Yeah. Off of the gas, yeah. and then you're moving. Yeah. <laughs> okay, not. <laughs> okay. So you go to take your foot off the gas, and your crazy friend sitting next to you is like, <laughs> and they reach over and they step their foot on the gas for you. And you're like, we're going to intersection, what are you doing? You start yelling at your friend. That would be an out of control friend. That would be a friend who was a proto-oncogene and now they have become a what? Oncogene. They're saying go, 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 go. So hopefully you're gonna be a tumor suppressor gene that's working and you're gonna step on the brake. And you're gonna step on the brake and you're gonna say stop. You know, so even though they're saying go and your tires are going, no, you're going, no, we're going to stop. So you won't get cancer yet, but if your foot slips off that brake, what's going to happen? You're going to go in the intersection and you're going to what? Die. Die. Okay. So this is a proto-oncogene is like being unable to take your foot off the gas in your car. Okay. And an oncogene is that cancer causing gene. And let me give you an example of one. It's called RAS. Normal RAS, okay, um, is you have a growth factor which triggers the RAS protein, which then triggers the DNA and says, okay, let's divide, okay? But if you have a bad RAS, it's like stepping on the gas, okay? Then, even though it hasn't received the signal, this protein is bad. Why is the RAS protein bad? Because the DNA is bad that coded for it. And this RAS still sends signals to the DNA to divide, even though you're not supposed to divide. Okay? So on your notes, where it says um, proto-oncogenes code for proteins that promote the cell cycle and prevent apoptosis. That's what they try to do. Like a gas pedal on a car. It's a stimulatory pathway. When they mutate, they become what? oncogenes or cancer-causing genes. You want to know how many of them there are that are in positions of power? 
over a hundred. There are over a hundred potential oncogenes. Okay, so normally, okay, proto oncogenes are fine, right? Most generals are perfectly wonderful, right? But you could have one that's bad. So um, the RAS gene family is associated with lung, colon, pancreatic cancers, leukemia, lymphoma, and thyroid cancers. Do you think the RAS gene family is getting investigated? Yeah. yeah. Well, what do yeah. you think? Do you think they're studying it? Oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. Because if you can take care of just that one gene that's mutating, then you could take care of all of these cancers right here. Okay? Um, you've heard of the breast cancer genes? That is a proto-oncogene that has become an oncogene. This is why you might have a relative or you've heard of people who have breast cancer in their family. Not all um, cancers are genetic, but breast cancer is. And so they will go and get tested for the BRCA1 gene because if they have it, that means it's possible they could develop what? Breast cancer. So sometimes that's when they're proactive and they say, I don't even want to worry about bre breast cancer because if it's going to go bad, if everything comes to play where it goes bad, then I'm going to get breast cancer. So I'm just going to have to remove my breast now, have the breast tissue removed so it's not even an option. See what I'm saying? So that is one way, if you know, you could test for that because you would have a high um, likelihood of developing breast cancer. All right, now let's compare this to um, a tumor suppressor gene. So a tumor suppressor gene, if it mutates, this is like your crazy friend is stepping on the gas. It's not a problem unless you have a crazy friend stepping on the gas. But if you have a crazy friend stepping on the gas and you go to step on your brakes, your brakes what? They don't work. Your brakes fail. So now you are for sure going to what? Die. Die. You're going to crash. Okay? So tumor suppressor genes code for proteins that inhibit the cell cycle and promote, what do we call cellular suicide? Apoptosis. Apoptosis. Like brakes on a car. This is their normal job. You only have, you're only, you have a problem is if your tumor suppressor genes fail, if your brakes fail. Then you're going to have a problem and this is when you're gonna get this uncontrolled growth. Now, if you look um, little letter A, it should take care of abnormal cells as a result of oncogenes. That's what its job is. There are around six identified tumor suppressor genes but P53, if this gene goes bad, the P53 gene, it is involved in almost half of all human cancers. Half of all human cancers. If we could figure out how to fix the P53 gene, that would mean your brakes would never fail for half of the cancers. So take everybody you've ever heard of that has cancer and cure half of them. Okay, because you make sure that their brakes do not fail. All right, um, not it. One of you is going to pick um, your. You can you can pick pick which one you want to talk about. But one of you, whoever got the nodded, is either picking proto oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. Go. All right, so now what I would be asking if I were you is what are the odds of that I will get what? Cancer. Okay, so where does cancer come from? So one of the ways that you can get cancer is you can inherit it. They know certain cancers which are heritable and some that are not. And so 
when you find out that a family member has cancer, you a lot of times it's at, you know you ask, you find out is this one of the ones that I could inherit um, or not. So that is one way to get it. So if you look under your notes for causes heredity, um, and if it's not in your DNA, if it's not something that was passed on to you by a family member, then the other reason you're going to get cancer is the environment in which you are living in. Something's getting into your body to cause that cancer. So some of the things you know about, obvious ones, are things like smoking. But so too are being overweight. Because when you're overweight like that, not to the same degree, obviously, but you have the wrong chemical balance. You are not in what? Homeostasis. Homeostasis. You have to be careful what kind of hormones you have in your body. There's a strong concern, a lot of you will go, your parents when they buy meat, they'll get hormone free, right? Certain meats, if you go to different stores, if you can afford that, because anything that's super healthy is super expensive. That's why people who are poor, right? People who are poor end up eating cheap, unhealthy food. Because, right, you can go to McDonald's, what, it's like you, you spend $5 and they give you like 10 cheeseburgers or whatever they're advertising in. And I'm not saying anything against McDonald's, but unhealthy food is usually cheaper than healthy food, okay? And so people are starting to look at what kind of things are we injecting in animals to make their meat bigger or larger, and then we're eating that. And then how is that impacting our body, okay? So things like that. Things like when we microwave, you know how they say microwave safe dishes? A lot of times, as long as it's not metal, you're like, ah, I'll throw it in there. People are concerned, what kind of plastics, when I microwave them, how does that impact the food? How does that impact me? Some people with your water bottles, you have plastic water bottles, but they tell you if you leave a plastic water bottle in your car for long amounts of time, it's probably not a good idea, right? So you're switching to not plastic, but what? Glass, right? And then you have like, but the glass can break, so you have to have some sort of case around it as well. So there are things in our environment that we never thought of as causing cancer. For instance, I told you, I grew up with baby oil, you grew up with sunscreen. So this is something in your environment, chemicals that you could get exposed to um, through your working environment. Now there are rules out there. Cal OSHA is looking at your environment and what you are exposed to. Soils get tested. There's a reason for the Environmental Protection Agency, okay? That protects you too. Okay, when we have these sort of rules out there, some people go, that's just a dumb rule. Okay, so there are rules out there that are in place to protect us and our exposure to certain chemicals. Um, if you, some of you, you don't have to tell me whether you have or not, but many of you have been vaccinated against the HPV virus, both men and women in here, okay? Because men, though you don't have a cervix to get cervical cancer, because your penis is like a little inoculating loop, you can take the HP virus from one vagina and spread it right on over to another vagina, okay? And then that you can facilitate the spread in that way. Girls, you don't wanna have the HPV virus because there's a higher incidence of cervical cancer. So if you now get inoculated against that, then you're less likely to have cervical cancer as an adult. These are all the things that we can take up care of now that are in our environment. So underneath that one, we have chemical carcinogens like what? Smoking. Examples like radiation from the sun. Viruses like HPV. HPV. So, you can't do anything about what you inherit other than you could check it, right? But you can do, you can take care of your environment but what's something you do want to do regularly is monitor your body. You can't see everything on your body with your eyes. You can feel for certain things, but you can't see things internally. So that's why you undergo um, different screenings. So one of the screenings are mammograms, ladies, okay? And you won't get those until you're older. And literally, it is like that. They grab your breast tissue, they put it between two like plates of glass is what it looks like. They smish the out of it. And you're just like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? And they try to get what they call chest wall. They try to get close enough to where your breast tissue comes out of your chest area. They want to get the muscle right there against your chest wall. And you let them do that. You know, and they'll go, can you handle this? Yes. Okay. Take it. 
take a couple Advil before you go. Remember this when you're older and you're like, oh, when I was in high school, my teacher told me. Maybe they'll have a better way. For instance, to check for prostate cancer, men, they used to is two fingers up your rectum and then they would feel it. Now there are blood tests to check for that. So maybe there'll be a better way, but currently if you get a mammogram, they smish it this way, then, and they, ha they have no, they're like, okay. And then they turn it sideways and they smish it another way as well. So that is a mammogram. Girls, okay, your hoo-ha is dark, warm, and moist. Things like to grow in it. And if you are sexually active, that means things are getting put inside of your vagina. Therefore, you need to get your vagina regularly evaluated because you can't see inside of it. So you need to be going to the gynecologist every year, every other year, as soon as you become sexually active so they can look to see if there are any issues inside of there. Okay, these are all tests that you can get done. Now, um, also there are blood tests. So they can just remove some of your blood to check for prostate cancer and see what your PSA levels are. From those PSA levels, they will know if you probably have an issue with your prostate or for lung cancer or for liver or for stomach cancer or breast cancer. They can check these things just by removing some of your blood. Or another thing they can do is actually check your DNA and, and from your cells actually look and identify your DNA and see if you are a carrier for one of these diseases that is inherited. Now once they check, if they think there's a potential you could have cancer, oftentimes what they want to do is do an initial biopsy. Now. Um, when you have a biopsy, they want to remove a few cells from that area to see if they are cancerous. Or is it just a cyst you have in your body of some fluid or something? So they want to evaluate that. Um, another way to check, okay, um, besides biopsies is they can, um, any kind of visual techniques, a PEP scan um, or a radioactive scan, they can look to see if there is possibly a tumor in there. If there is a tumor in there, what are they gonna wanna do? Yeah, if they can, they will remove it. And they will accompany this with chemotherapy or radiation in order to destroy, what they try to destroy is the fastest growing cells in your body, which would normally be cancer cells if you have cancer, but also your hair is fast growing too. So that's why some people lose their hair because it destroys all of the fast growing cells in your body and that's why people get so sick. And so you could have chemotherapy, you could have surgery, maybe you take some pills as well. So on your notes, go to diagnosis. Routine screening tests like colonoscopy, so they're looking in your colon, but now you can just poo and send them a poo sample and then they will evaluate that sample, okay? Um, a mammogram and then a pap smear. A pap smear, they take a giant Q-tip, ladies, and they rub it on your cervix, it feels kind of weird. And then they take the cells and they'll put it onto a slide and then see what kind of cells grow to see if there's any kind of issues there. Um, tumor marker tests, you can use your blood. And then I gave an example, PSA for prostate cancer. And then there are genetic tests for colon, bladder, breast, thyro thyroid, and melanoma. And then confirming the diagnosis, they will have a biopsy to allow for removal of cells so they can examine them. And remember, they know what to look for. You know what to look for in irregularly shaped cells, abnormal nuclei, you know all those things. And then imaging techniques, um, laparoscopy, radioactive scan, and ultrasound, all of those things will confirm a diagnosis. They can either see the tissue itself or do some ultrasound of that area and then confirm it. Okay, and then your treatment, the standard treatments are surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And then maybe in the future, they will have just like you have HPV virus and you have a vaccine against it because it leads to potentially getting cervical cancer, maybe there will be cancer vaccines. So it's like, oh, I've been vaccinated against breast cancer, thyroid cancer, pancreatic cancer, like you could just get a vaccine. 
Um, P53 therapy, if you remember that, that P53, that is one of the tumor assassin like genes and it's involved in half of all cancers. So maybe there'll be a way to make sure that your P53 genes are okay. Or drugs to prevent angiogenesis, drugs to prevent the blood flow to it. Right now, they're doing a lot of things really cool with antibodies. We haven't discussed our immune system yet, but we will. But they're using antibodies to go in and target cancer cells. I mean, if you've heard of the phrase immunotherapy. So there are some different um, strategies there as well. Okay, so those are your future therapies. Um, oldest, you go first. Tell them one new thing that you have learned about um, the causes, diagnosis, and treatment. And then youngest bio buddy, you tell them one new thing you learned either about cause, diagnosis, or treatment of cancer. Go ahead. DNA in your body, what you would identify, that region in DNA that you would say, this is a proto-oncogene, proto that spot in your DNA, in your nucleus. Hey, Hulk smash, Black Widow, Superman. got what I was saying. I know what some of you, why you picked C, because you said a proto-oncogene doesn't cause cancer. What causes cancer? Oncogene. Oncogene. I get that. Okay. But what it's saying is that region in your DNA identified as a proto-oncogene could cause cancer if it mutated into a what? Oncogene. Okay. This is a map. You just had your last lecture of the semester. Oh, wow. yeah. What's this? Okay, you will not receive new content until January. Okay, so now we're just getting ready for our what? Final. Okay. And you're going to take care of half of your final points in the next few days, right? Next few class periods. And when we start talking about the Octodoc, half your points are coming from that. Groot. Oh, I love baby Groot. Have you seen Baby Groot? Yes. Groot. Groot. What does it do? Aww. One person. Find that one person. Shame bell them. Yeah, I forgot genetics. Yeah. Genetics do you guys cancer to? Good job, Black Widow. <laughs> Green Arrow, Superman. So close. Anything underneath the diagnosis box? Look at your diagnosis box. Anything found in the diagnosis box?
Chemotherapy is a chemical that's going through your body, like injected, like through an IV or a pill. Um, and radiation, they're sending waves of energy in trying to destroy it. Oftentimes, things like radiation, they'll use, like, they'll tattoo parts of your body where they know the tumor is. And um, they'll tattoo it. They'll take a bunch of old stones first and find out where it is. And then they'll target that one area. Some people go with that because chemotherapy affects every part of your body. Radiation, it could still make you super sick. But you won't, like, usually, you won't lose your hair and stuff with radiation. Yeah, it was all of them. Most of you got that, 87% of you. Good job, 87%, but all of those on there could confirm or diagnose. everything you need for the semester and we're going to transition now and I'll start talking about the Octodoc so I'm going to go ahead and call quits now I need you to get into your Google Drive okay and I hope you're having a good day make good choices <laughs>